Housing Health Minister Mamuluku Kubai Ngobani will this morning brief the country on government's efforts to combat a third wave of COVID-19 infections. We're told she'll be joined by Public Service and Administration Minister Senzum Kunu and a panel of experts. The Acting Minister is expected to announce the next phase of the vaccination rollout for other age groups. So far, more than 2 million COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in South Africa, with Gauteng and KZN leading the national vaccination rollout program. What do we make of this? Let's bring in UKZN's Acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation, Professor Musha, Musa Mushavela, who joins us via our video link. Prof, always great to chat to you, especially when I can get your name right the first time. But uh, let's get straight into our discussion. There is a lot of call it concern, top of mind for people in Gauteng, understandably so, especially because it feels like it's taking an incredibly long time for government to announce some kind of intervention. What does that say to you around the bureaucracy in making calls around COVID-19? Yeah, no, um, good morning, Ayanda uh, and Michelle and the AM report viewers. I, I think that uh, the issue at the moment is really about uh, crisis management. Mm. Um, I think whenever you get into a stage of a crisis like we are in, especially in Gauteng, um, one needs to be able to have a system of decision making that is rapid. And uh, we talk about this a lot in terms of pandemics and epidemics and response to those. There is always, it's an emergency. There's a need to make decisions and make decisions quickly and act on them with the best information available to you at the time. Yes, a lot of the times, you know, you might worry about some unintended consequences and collateral damage that might come from those uh, decisions. But if you don't act, then, you know, the virus is not going to slow down. Uh, Dr. Mike Ryan of the WHO speaks very uh, highly and very articulately about this in terms of the need for a rapid decision-making process. And we are not seeing that, especially the disconnect between the provincial decision-making and the, and the national or central decision-making processes. So that, for me, there is a leadership gap for, you know, designed specifically for a, a pandemic response which requires rapid decision-making. In a context where we've been told a hard lockdown, even at this stage, would be a little too late, from your vantage point, what are the options here? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we have made a slight mistake as a country to zoom in a lot into Gauteng, which is understandable because of the crisis that is there. But it's important to step back and actually look at what is happening in the whole country as well to see how, you know, a decision that can be made in favor of Gauteng, for example, might still be of an advantage to other provinces. So two days ago, for example, the, the South African um, uh, Modeling Consortium announced formally that uh, the, the province of uh, Western Cape and, and Pumalanga have also officially entered their third waves. So the provinces that are left currently is Limpopo, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and Eastern Cape that have not officially entered the third wave. So in this regard, you can see that we do have a problem al around the country already where we are seeing rapid increase in, 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 rapid increase in infections. My view is that in as much as it might be a little bit late to act for Gauteng in terms of intensifying restrictions, I, I think it's still, we are still in time to intensify restrictions nationally to benefit the other provinces that are lagging behind. There are three provinces that are also important drivers of the, of the pandemic in South Africa, Western Cape, KZN, and Eastern Cape. We know that. So I would say that, you know, uh, in as much as I don't agree with, you know, going to level four, but I do think that there's room to intensify restrictions within level three, which is really urgent and it's important uh, for us to make that decision so that we can limit people's movement and all so that we can just restrict movement in general, break transmission, and, and make sure that people can isolate, contacts can be traced, and we, we, we can reduce, close the tap, so that you know, we limit the number of people who end up needing hospital care. Our health system is not going to cope. Yeah, there's often talk about circuit breakers, and that's probably what we should be focusing on. Let's um, mention, I guess, what we should be thinking about insofar as the vaccination is concerned. Interestingly, at 7.30 in a few minutes' time, we're expecting Senzo Mkunu to be part of the briefing. 
What does that signal to you? Is that perhaps a sign of more age groups or more sectors of the labor force being eligible possibly for vaccine? Yeah, no, that's a very important question. I wondered about that as well because uh, I thought maybe they would also have a uh, Minister of Employment and Labor present. I, I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the rationale is also because we also have to do this across sectors in, in the private sector as well. So I, I think that it does sort of uh, begin to signify uh, the, some steps towards what the acting Minister of, of Health indicated um, a few days ago, that they may start opening the registration for the 40-year-olds uh, to 60 years. And these are people who are active in the, in the working sector. And the sort of uh, logistical challenges we're seeing with um, vaccination for teachers are things that have to be considered carefully for, for, for the 42 to, to, to 60 age group. It's still not clear whether those uh, that age group will be divided into two groups, the 50 to 59 and the 40 to 49, or whether it will be just taken as one group of 42 to 49 in terms of registrations. But those are the things that we can we can expect to hear. I do think that if they do go this route, it's it's a positive step, and uh, it just needs to also come with details around the vaccine doses, um, the logistical plans. And we have learned lessons. We cannot be repeating the same mistakes we, we have seen with the 60-plus with the age group uh, activities around the EVDS, mm. around the logistics. Bit. They need to be clear on how we are going to make sure that we limit transmission of infections in this whole process. Right now, what we've been doing really has not really been in favor of um, you know, our efforts to try and avoid gatherings. But we need to think about how to do more of this outside of facilities, in workplaces, closer to people's homes, so that we can limit congregation. Right. Speaking about lessons learned, there has been a lot of concern around the uptake of vaccines by those over the age of 60. People anecdotally speaking about rocking up at vaccination sites and finding people idling, not because there aren't vaccines there or people to administer them, but because there aren't recipients actually coming forward. What does that highlight for you? Yeah, no, indeed, I, and I, I think that, um, you know, in this, in this whole thing, we tend to plan from the perspective of supply. We say, okay, we're going to use health facilities. We're going to provide products like vaccines in health facilities for the most part. And um, we will then make so much available and we will see so many people a day in terms of capacity. These are all supply side issues. We don't deal enough in this country with demand side issues. Mm. We don't actively intervene in terms of the concerns that people who have to use these products have, their interests, their patterns, what their preferences, their choices. We don't interact at that level. And so you cannot make a program that is planned largely on supply logistics without necessarily looking at demand. Remember that hospitals are based on the are designed around the assumption that anyone who's sick will come to you. So those people don't have a choice. They will come to you because they're sick. Um, and if they don't come, that's not your problem. But when you're doing a vaccination and prevention, it's planned around people who are well and healthy. They don't have to come to you. So you need to find a way of making sure that you reach out to them, you incentivize them to, to come to you or to come to vaccination. And in some places, we've seen examples of, uh, you know, healthcare workers going out into households and homes to actually visit people who are elderly, which makes absolute sense. You have to take into account uh, the needs of the demand side and make sure that there is a degree of fit between supply and demand. For me, this is my own analysis of the mm. problem with the way that we've been planning and our healthcare system is not designed to be providing sort of upstream prevention services. It's designed largely for curative treatment kind of services. Interesting insights. Of course, there's a great anticipation on the back of what was hailed as a major announcement in the agreement to produce mnra vaccines in south africa some kind of technology agreement there help us understand what this actually means though the science is fascinating to me but may be lost to an ordinary <laughs> south african we have mnra yeah. vaccines and viral vector vaccines should we care mm -hmm. 
Yes, absolutely. I think that these technologies are important. So there's a lot that we can discuss around this in terms of the meaning and implications of it. But it suffice to say that the mRNA is the technology we are using for Pfizer currently in South Africa and also used for Moderna. And there's definitely an opportunity to expand on, on the mRNA technology. And the technology does not require huge infrastructure. And we don't have any uh, technology registered in Africa for mRNA. We don't have the expertise to, to design vaccines or any products based on mRNA. And uh, we need people to be trained. We need facilities. We need the technology, the infrastructure. We, we have got no patents that are registered on mRNA in, in South Africa at the moment or anywhere in Africa from what is known. So I would say that what we are seeing here is an opportunity, Ayanda, that would benefit us in the future, not in the short term. So maybe in about two to three years, it will benefit us. It is exciting that it, will, it is being announced and it's exciting that it will start now in terms of agreements, um, facilities, uh, training and you know the chances are we'll also be training for other countries mm -hmm. here in South Africa at the African plant that is going to be um, uh, used where the mRNA technology is going to be based. We'll be training for other countries so it will have good contribution and it will help in terms of preparedness but we can, we can also get new vaccines like vaccines for, for TB, we can get vaccines for uh, malaria based on this technology. The opportunities are immense but, you know, that's what it is. It is an opportunity. It's an investment that can benefit us in the future. But it's definitely a step forward. It will put Africa ahead of the curve because we are running behind in right. terms of this uh, te technological platform. Professor Mosa Mushabela, always great chatting to you, sir. Really, thanks very much indeed for making time for us. Professor Mushabela is with UKZN. He's the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, I should add, for Research and Innovation. Once again, Prof, thanks very much indeed.